get started. Um, so just a, a quick overview of today's agenda. Um, I'm gonna really quickly touch base on some of the election items on which the chamber endorsed. Um, and then we have uh, Peter Weiss here to share with us. And um, then we're gonna get into our presentation. Our, our speaker, um, Summer Stefan, will be joining us at about 8.15. So with that, I'd just like to uh, welcome everybody to the Oceanside Chamber Emerging Issues Forum. Thank you for taking time to join us this morning. So just a, a quick overview. Um, I'm, I'm only going to touch on the on the races and ballot measures in which the chamber endorsed, but I know that there are other people on the call that had involvement with some of the other races and measures. So towards the end of the meeting, we'll do a quick round table. So if anybody wants to touch on any of the any of the um, the election items that the chamber did not endorse on, you'll have the opportunity to do that. Um, after our legislative reports. So um, just a quick overview on, um, on our council races. Um, Peter's here with us and in just a, a minute or two, I'm gonna turn it over to him and give him the opportunity to, to share with us. But um, we, we do wanna congratulate uh, Peter Weiss um, for his victory in uh, District 4. Um, it's, uh, you're leading by quite a bit and uh, I know um, it's an insurmountable lead, so we're, um, we're very confident in being able to congratulate you. Um, Ryan Keim is our in endorsed candidate for District 3, and um, that race is very tight. Um, Ryan is currently leading by about 350 votes with 64% um, of, um, of the vote in, and I've been watching that regularly. I guess um, from what I have been told, we we won't get updates um, until later today, um, possibly the afternoon. Um, so we'll see how that that race um, shapes up. But uh, we are um, still very confident uh, in, in, in that it's going to turn out our way on that uh, District 3 race. Um, the chamber um, did endorse a, a no position on Prop 15, um, which was we saw as a as a threat to our Proposition 13 tax protection. So as of this morning, um, it's at 52% no, and that's um, and if anybody anybody can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it just shows 72% of the votes in on on all the propositions. So if anybody knows better than that, let me know. But as of about a half hour ago, it showed that um, all of these were 72% of the vote in. So Prop 15, um, the no on 15 is 52%. Um, we did support yes on L, um, that that lost um, by about, uh, that, that was 67% no on that. Um, we supported yes on Prop 22, um, looks like that is passing um, with 58% of the vote which means that you will still be able to take an Uber or a Lyft um, in California. Um, that was, that possibility was threatened. And one that just baffles me is the, um, we supported yes on 20 um, and that that's getting crushed 62% um, no on that. So that one is uh, incredibly disappointing because we felt like it was, it was going to be a real positive step in, um, in moving moving us um, towards some solutions to the problems that we see on our streets and um, the, the theft crime with small businesses and so on. So um, I'm not sure where people were coming from on their vote on that, but uh, that one is, is disappointing. So with that, um, we have about seven minutes until, um, until summer joins us and, and speaks. So Peter, that, that time is yours. Um, so again, congratulations and, uh, and welcome. Hey, thank you, Scott. And uh, first, I do need to thank Scott and the chamber and all the chamber members for their endorsement of me and my campaign and the, uh, the support you've shown me. I think it made a great uh, deal of difference in um, being able to reach out to some of those people who were looking for reasons to vote for somebody. I mean, I knocked on quite a few doors and it was very interesting when you talk to people what's important to them and who they respond to. And I can tell you without fail that everybody that's out there knows who the Chamber of Commerce is. You may not know who's on it, but you know the chamber, you recognize the name of the Chamber of Commerce. And I think uh, your endorsement carried a lot of weight and I do appreciate that. Um, 
you know, he said, what, what's my vision for the next four years? Well, the, in the short term, it's going to be following the results to see what happens uh, in the District 3 race. Uh, that will make a big difference uh, because that will also decide, I think it'll, it'll be a prelude to what we do to fill the, what is now the vacant seat uh, left behind by um, Esther Sanchez and how, how we go about doing that. Uh, but one of the things you alluded to that is quite disappointing is the failure of Prop 20. You know, one of the biggest problems, if you look at uh, the results of our the police survey we just did, and also in, in having talked to a number of people, the, the issue of homelessness is of significant concern to a great many people in Oceanside, and not just Oceanside, but throughout, you know, San Diego County and, and, and the state. And Prop 20, I think, would have put some additional tools in the toolbox to start addressing some of the symptomatic issues behind some of our chronic homelessness. Um, you know, those that are out there, the working poor, uh, we have different venues and programs to allow them to get help. If you're out there and you want help, you can get help. The ones we're having the biggest issue with are the criminally homeless and the, those that are in need of significant mental health or substance abuse uh, issues. You know, we, um, one of the things I'm, I'm proud of, and it's a lot of it was behind the scenes, and I know Crystal's on the phone, but is working with Jim Desmond's office to, you know, find the funding gap that we had to allow McAllister Institute to come in and set up a sobering center in Oceanside. Uh, we also have with the county uh, a crisis stabilization unit. We are in the process now of issuing an RFP uh, to look at a comprehensive uh, homeless shelter, transitional housing, and support programs that we're going to try to cite somewhere in the city. Everybody wants to, to us to look at solving the homeless problem. It, it won't be solved, but we need to take in, incremental steps to address it. And we're going to need support to do that because no matter where you try to put one of these services, someone's going to complain about it. And so we are going to have to work together to start putting together programs that will help um, address some of the underlying issues of homelessness so we can slowly start to make a difference. And I know you have um, the summer coming on. One of the biggest issues we have is with our significantly criminal element, we need the district attorney's office to start prioritizing when we have multiple arrests of multiple offenders that they actually start prosecuting some of these cases. And I think that will help as well. Um, but you know, to me, that is one of the biggest problems that, that we are going to have over the next few years. The other one, I think we need to come to some type of solution on at least provide a direction. And it's one of our bigger issues. And that's the, the issue of sand on the beach. We've started that process. It's going to take some time. And that is one of those that no matter what we do, it's going to take a long time to get to a solution. But honestly, it's one of our priorities because it does affect directly our tourism industry, which is a significant economic driver for us. So I know the study's underway, but the same thing, when that, when that comes forward, there's going to be groups of people that are going to be opposed to pretty much anything we do. And so we are going to have to work uh, collaboratively to try to get pressure on not just the city, but will end up being state and uh, federal agencies to participate in whatever that solution uh, is or looks like. So, I mean, those are two, I mean, obviously we have, we're gonna have much more with COVID and everything else going on. You know, hopefully we don't drop back into the purple um, and honestly, I think if the, if the state tries to put us in the purple, I think we're going to have a, a, a revolt uh, because there are going to be businesses that are not going to want to shut down. And so I, I think we, we, um, you know, we need to do what we can do as, as the local government to try to keep those businesses open. And um, you know, seriously, the, the, the push to go backwards, I think, will be disastrous for a lot of people. So um, with that, uh, I will leave a minute or so if you have any questions or any of your um, the viewers have any questions. Uh, if not, um, thank you again very much for your support and endorsement, and uh, I hope to serve you well. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, and I don't know if you're able to um, stay on the call for a bit, but towards the end, uh, if there's any of the local measures you want to touch on, you'll have you know we'll give you the opportunity to do that with the term limits and um, and measure uh, what was the other. Um, Measure M. Uh, so, if you want to touch on that toward the end, I do have a quick question. So, if if Ryan does hold on to uh, District Three, uh, we're pretty confident that you and Ryan and Christopher can come together on an appointment to um, for District One. If he does not hold on, do you anticipate that, that would mean a special election? Uh, if he doesn't hold on, I suspect it would be a two-two for an appointment. So, we'd be going to a special election. And that it, since it's it's not it's an off election cycle, that is going to be a pretty pricey election if we do that. And when um, when would that 
potentially take place? Uh, I, I don't know because we, there's a certain amount of time where we have to declare the vacancy, then we have to go through the process, either appoint or call the election, and then the election has to be called, I think, it's, it's some weird number, 88 or nine, 88 to 120 days after. So we would probably be uh, in the summer of, of 2021. Okay. All right. Well, um, I don't see Summer on the call yet. Um, and Cameron, her, oh, Cameron, um, is, is Summer on the call yet? Hello, she not on at the moment, but she'll be logging on any moment. Okay. Well, Peter, do you want to real quickly touch on the, on the, on the two or three measures um, that impacted Oceanside? Term limits, um, you know, personally to me, we have term limits every four years. You just you get voted out of office. Um, but I understand why we did what we did, and I, I think it'll end up being a good thing. Uh, so we don't have career politicians. Um, and I will say one of the biggest priorities that we collectively need to address in the next few years is finding that next crop of people who are interested in becoming a city council member whether that means we get them onto the planning commission or the police and fire commission but we need to start recruiting now to get people in a position so that in four years or eight years or 12 years we have a crop of people that are coming up behind that are supportive of businesses that can run for the city council and make it successful um, that's one of the things i think is going to be a priority and i want to talk to you at some other point scott about mm -hmm. finding those people and getting them into a position to uh, get into committees and commissions and onto the city council. Um, the cannabis tax measure um, obviously passed. We actually we had a, a lot of support from the cannabis industry, primarily because they want to sh make sure that money that as it comes in goes to what would be expanded enforcement of not just the legalized cannabis industry, but the illicit side of things. So. Um, we, we have committed that uh, some of that money is, is going to go to that so we can uh, start weeding out the illicit industry uh, since it is a legal product and, and help the businesses that are legally doing this uh, become successful. And then the last one, just real quick, is on North River Farms, which uh, I, I think uh, I personally wasn't surprised of, of how, what happened at, at the ballot just because the, the number of those projects that get on the ballot over the last few years in the county uh, tended to fail. Uh, but I, I think it shows one of the problems we have, you know, the same people who are opposed to the project or were opposed to putting the roadways in that would provide significant traffic relief, meaning Melrose. Uh, and then the same ones who are complaining that we don't have a housing that's affordable. And you, you kind of look at the, the common sense side of it, you say, okay, with all of the money that got put into just you know, supporting, you know, you know, at some point, the, the price of houses is going to keep going up unless we do something to expedite the process to get more housing production across all income levels, not just the low end, um, across all income levels. Uh, the cost of housing for our kids and grandkids is, is not going to be attainable. So we have to find a way to get housing, get more housing approved and get it in production uh, so we can we can stabilize the price of housing and get our kids living here in Oceanside so they don't have to drive from Temecula or Wildemar and clog up the, the, the roads. Uh, if we can get them working here and get them living here, then we can have we don't we can eliminate those long commutes. And I, I think that is going to be critical in the long term. We're going to have to find a way and we're going to have to overcome the nimbyism to be able to provide reasonable and balanced housing in Oceanside. Peter, what are your thoughts on on um, you know housing being included in in South Morro Hills and the South Morro Hills plan and and the general plan um, update? So to me, if if you look at and, and I'm just going to use rough numbers, if everyone did two and a half acre lots in Morro Hills, you'd have about I don't know 1,400 homes. And I know nobody wants that. I, I mean, I have talked with Dennis and the others out there; they don't want that. So we're not going to do. Let's not do 1,400 homes. Let's make it a thousand but you still want it rural. So you put the housing down by North River Road, you put in the infrastructure, you set them back from the road, kind of like what more, um, North River Farms was doing. You put in a thousand homes down by the road and you call it a day. Uh, you have the infrastructure there to serve it. You don't need to worry about putting sewers up into the middle of Morrill Hills. You don't need to, you know, you leave the rest of Morrill Hills as rural as it is and you put the housing down by where the roads are and where the access is. And, and I, I think that there's going to need to be uh, a consideration for adding housing in Morrill Hills. You're allowed to put it there now. Now the matter of how do you put it, how do you cluster it so that it achieves a reasonable balance? And I think we're going to have to plan for that. And in the absence of a plan for that, you're allowing each, you're gonna have each and every homeowner, worst cases, put two and a half acre lots in, which again, 
the, the same people who are arguing today against North River Farms would argue against, you know, the Milanos putting two and a half, two and a half acre lots all over. So there, there needs to be a compromise and a balance. And I think we can find that. It's just going to have to be overcome that nimbyism by the people who don't want anything. And I think that's one of the problems is that there are people who just absolutely want nothing. It's no one, everything. Stop, oppose, everything. So we're going to need to find a balance and we're going to need to stand up for that pressure. And I think there, I think the council will be willing to do that. Okay. Uh, well, we, we still have a little time while we wait for sure. summer. Um, and do any of you have any other questions for our newly elected District 4 candidate who I'm going to have a hard time stopping referring to as Mayor Weiss? Uh, it's Peter. My mom didn't name me mayor. <laughs> Any other questions? Feel free to un unmute yourself and, and chime in. Well, in that case, um, can I, uh, Dr. Vitale, could I pick on you to maybe give us a, a brief update on, on Measure W? Yes, I would love for you to uh, pick on me for Measure W. Uh, Measure W is looking really great, and we're very excited that the residents of Oceanside uh, turned up for us and are supporting us so far. Um, yes, there'll be an update coming out today, as I understand it, Scott, at 5 o'clock, uh, but right now uh, we are passing at 61%, uh, percent, and we need 55 for this to take effect. So. We're very excited about um, uh, the initial uh, showing and um, are really excited once the election is finalized to really thank the community for showing up for us. So it's, it's a very exciting time for us. Yeah, and uh, you know, just, you know, I know uh, it's a slightly premature for a full on congratulations, but uh, it looks like it's heading in that direction. Um, but for, um, for you to uh, get a bond measure passed in in, in current circumstances is um, is quite a feat. So you know, congratulations on on the hard work. Thank you. We're quite exhausted. Uh, we had uh, an awful lot of energy towards it, and a lot of people that volunteered for the campaign, and uh, a board that was just steadfastly in support of this work. So we're excited uh, to get that final confirmation. And then, you know, begin that difficult work of where does that money go? Uh, and you may or may not know that we do have a uh, modernization and process at the San Luis Rey site. And the board has also allocated funding to uh, modernizing Jefferson Middle School. And we're in the process of designing uh, that campus as well. So those are two very exciting projects that are already in the queue uh, with Measure H. And so uh, we're excited to, con to continue uh, improving our school locations for the city. Um, if everything holds up, what would be the time frame for you know funding to um, become available and other projects to come online? That's a good question, Scott. Thanks for asking that uh, to the superintendent, not the business girl. Um, huh. So I would imagine uh, within the next year or two, uh, we still have to um, uh, finish uh, spending Prop H. That'll happen. Uh, we should get our net issuance next year. So I would imagine in 2022, but the planning for that will start uh, prior to that because there's a lot of conversation and prior prioritization that needs to happen. Um, but what's exciting is we already have work going on right now uh, that the community can see efforts of previous bond measures uh, paying off. And one more that I want to mention is El Camino High School. If you haven't been by El Camino lately, um, the campus looks absolutely amazing. And even though you haven't been able to go inside, uh, we have uh, completely renovated the Truax Theater there and also the gymnasium that hadn't been done since its initial building. So our campuses are just looking absolutely fantastic and uh, taxpayers can see their dollars at work. So uh, we're excited ab about these projects. Good. Well, thank you so much and uh, congratulations. And we will... Uh... We will certainly invite you back uh, maybe sometime next year to give a give us a more thorough update on on what's happening. I would love to. Honor. All right, and I thought I just saw Summer log on to the call. Summer, are you with us? I know she's logging on right now, so she should be on any minute if she's not on yet. Yeah, it's showing that uh, it's showing that she's joining. 
So perfect. Give it a moment here. Oh, there you are. Hi, Summer. You're muted. Hi. Hi, Summer. Welcome. Thank you. How are you doing? Good, good, good timing. We just uh, did a, a brief election recap and uh, we are ready for you. So I'm just going to do a, a brief intro and then we'll turn it right over to you. So great. So very pleased to welcome our district attorney, Summer Steffen. Um, Summer has devoted her life to protecting children and families, providing justice to the most vulnerable, and is a national leader in the fight against human trafficking and sexual exploitation. So, Summer, we're glad to have you with us here today. Thank you. It's really terrific to be with the Oceanside Chamber. Um, thank you to Cameron Celeste, our community relations officer, for being out there and recognizing that North County is really important. Sometimes it gets slightly neglected, but, but not by our office, because as some of you may know, um, I spent a lot of my career in North County. I, before becoming uh, chief deputy district attorney and before uh, becoming the district attorney, I spent um, five years as the chief of the North County branch. So I know every nook and cranny of uh, the North um, and the public safety in the North and what happens in the North uh, County. And um, so it's, um, it's really near and dear to my heart and all of the communities there. So I wanna kind of get right into it. I, I think, um, oh, uh, on my mind is that I just spoke with your longtime uh, mayor, Jim Wood, um, and um, you checked in on him and he's doing, he's doing well. We, we, we uh, were trying to console each other over the loss, uh, the death of a former chief deputy DA in my office uh, who died recently. And uh, we both, you know, loved and knew him well. So, uh, it gave us a chance to catch up. Um, so you've been through also an election. I saw that. Obviously, I, I'm using a government computer, so I can't talk about politics at all. Um, try, being uh, the rule follower that I am, which can be very annoying, but that's what you want in your district attorney. Um, I um, spent, as you know, 30 years in law enforcement uh, in the DA's office, rising through the ranks to become the DA. And that has served us well during this time where we're um, up against one crisis after another. You know, this is a really unprecedented time where we're dealing with uh, economic crisis. We're dealing with our court system shutting down uh, for a while, causing thousands of cases to be backlogged. Um, also being able to meet the due process uh, deadlines that we have. Um, we, for in custody cases, we can't just say like we uh, missed the deadline because of COVID, you know, that, that doesn't work. We're an essential team at the DA's office, a thousand, employees that are dedicated to justice. And my, my singular focus at the beginning of this pandemic was uh, how do I make sure that our team performs so that no rapists, murderers, you know, people who are uh, danger to our community are uh, let out because we missed a deadline because everything is so uh, mixed up and staff is you know trying to remotely work some at home and so we uh, fortunately for me I'm a big Star Trek fan and I know you all are wondering how the, does this like help but it really does help it gave me an in inspiration that we can beam into a courtroom literally like Star Trek like beam me up Scotty you know and so I um worked with the sheriff, with the uh, court, and with our amazing ITD system. We have an incredible leader for our technology team, Sam Georges. And 
we decided that we would all use the same platform, the same technology. So from the beginning, instead of each of us trying to go here and there and try to figure it out on our own, we got together, figured out what's the most secure platform for a sensitive criminal cases. And having decided that within two weeks, it's a little kind of hard to, to explain how much action was going on. Um, the uh, My office converted to the system remotely, the court converted, and um, the jail put in systems in special rooms to also be able to remotely arraign and do preliminary hearings for defendants. Now that bought us a lot of time and it allowed us, unlike many regions that have experienced a true increase in crime because they didn't have an organized system by which to do bail hearings, to conduct a risk assessment, to decide who should be or shouldn't be released um, in, a, in a methodical appropriate method we were able to do that in San Diego, and I'm, I'm very proud of all the stakeholders for getting that done. We ended up now being able to literally do thousands of cases by remote hearings where uh, the defendant is prioritizing in custody cases because they're the more serious. Defendant is able to be beamed into the courtroom. The judge is there with the clerk taking uh, a record, the DAs beaming in from their office, our witnesses have special witness victim rooms that are COVID appropriate so they can also beam in and testify. Um, so we that uh, got us through, but then we hit another wall, which is that the one area that the constitution does not allow for remote hearings is jury trials. So, um, with the jury trials, it has to, the right to confrontation requires it to be a live hearing. And so the court um, built up three courtrooms as COVID appropriate courtrooms with plexiglass between the jurors um, and uh, at, in the jury box because they sit really close together, as you know. Um, and um, we began jury trials. We're in our second big jury trial. Uh, we finished one, which was an elder abuse case where the jury felt very comfortable, very safe. We had no problems. And uh, we, you know, we, we got an, an ethical appropriate conviction for uh, a guy who um, mercilessly beat up a, an elder businessman just because um, he wanted to have freebies and other things anyhow. Um, so everything um, everything went uh, really well with that and we're in our second trial. In North County, they're also building a COVID courtroom, but they're beginning their experiment downtown with three courtrooms that are COVID friendly because the courtrooms there are a little bit bigger. And then they're, they're gonna refurbish some courtrooms in North County, I would say to begin in January, but cases that are of the essence may be transferred downtown to be tried. That's, that's, the, that's the system we're looking at. On the out of custody front, we have thousands of cases that are gonna be coming back to court. It's uh, gonna be a crushing workload for our team and for the court. But I know we're going to get through it by prioritizing and keeping a level head and and uh, making our adjustments. Now, on the um, during this, you know, um, unfortunately, our our prison system has decided that at times they wanted to just release people without really doing a thorough risk assessment without doing the things that need to be done in terms of notification to victims. You might have seen on the news yesterday that I'm fighting against the early release of a guy who killed four people. 
uh, driving under the influence, uh, crashed through the Coronado Bridge. It made national news. He injured seven, killed four, and had only served two years, 10 months of his nine year sentence, which was already a very low sentence after conviction. That sentence is already served at 50% credit. So I'm asking the prison authorities and the governor, what is the reason? There is no reason. He, he does, there's no, nothing to indicate he's a young man, that he's compromised, that there's anything going on. So now we established an emergency team to notify victims' families of these releases because they deserve to know. You know, a few weeks ago, we had to notify a victim of severe domestic violence. She's so terrified. We had to help relocate her, um, provide her trauma services. It's, it, it's like the, I understand the pandemic. I just don't understand why we wouldn't do it the way we're doing it in San Diego, which is a methodical um review of what impact it has on victims, on community, what is the crime, um, you know, is it non-serious, is it truly non-serious, the underlying facts, but that's not being done. So we're constantly shifting. I'm, I'm, I'm really blessed with an incredible team, so I keep putting more on them, like starting this emergency team but we can't leave it to others to do it because they're not getting notified and we have to notify them. That's the decent thing to do. You shouldn't have to run across your abuser uh, when they're standing at your front door, not knowing that they've been paroled. So, um, so, th so that's what we're doing uh, right now with, with the early releases from prison. About 800 have been released already into our community. I'm, I'm on parole and probation to make sure that they're being supervised. Um, I'm taking a stand on the ones that, like I, like I explained, that are uh, really uh, unacceptable and we'll see what happens there. On the North County public safety front, one of the big um, negative trends we're seeing is that North County is sadly home to 40% or of our overdose deaths, uh, our, our drug overdose deaths. So this is really, really traumatic. It's hitting many families, many communities, every age from uh, 16 to 72, um, these overdose deaths. And one of the factors that we're seeing this increase, this real doubling of overdose deaths um, is the prevalence of fentanyl. Fentanyl is a high, high content opioid. It is um, like heroin on steroids. Um, just two salt baths can kill a human being, but the cartels always looking for a way to cut their costs, ha are using fentanyl to lace uh, pills that look like Oxy and Percocet. They look harmless. They're little blue pills that um, sometimes kids get a hold of in parties. They get from the shelf. They get off the street when prescriptions for Oxy and Percocet stop. And they don't realize that they're actually not even just counterfeit pills, they are laced with fentanyl. And so last year, all of last year, we had 151 deaths in 2019 from overdose related to fentanyl. This year we're at 250 and we expect it to keep going up through the holidays, which are sometimes a time that triggers um, depression, anxiety, and other things that uh, make people use these pills. I see that we have um, Colonel Whitley with us. This is also hitting the military. We've had some uh, military deaths from fentanyl overdose. Um, we've seen more deaths from isolation, from um, you know, people feeling disconnected, losing jobs, looking for something to numb their pain. And what is uh, what they don't realize is what they're buying 
is, is not a regular oxypercocet pill. They're buying a, a death sentence, really. This is just to describe to you how potent this stuff is. We had a police officer in Escondido Police Department almost die because he handled with gloves the outside of a package that had fentanyl-laced opioids. He was so close to death that it took, the only reason he lived is because there were police officers right there with him to witness him going on the nod. And they had Narcan available. And they were able to, they needed two cans of Narcan to resuscitate him, not just one. So one thing that we tell families um, that believe that they have family members that are uh, abusing uh, opioids is to have Narcan available. In fact, each family is entitled to, with the prescription for opioids, to get a prescription for Narcan, which, and it's very easy to use. And of course, what we want is for people to not abuse opioids. But we also know that the addiction is so strong that we want families to try to resuscitate and save their loved ones. We created, to meet the moment, a uh, campaign with Health and Human Services called the Opioid, the San Diego Opioid Project. And you can find it at the San Diego Opioid Project.org. And it has a lot of information about how our brain reacts to opioids that are prescribed by a doctor in the same way as it reacts to heroin. Um, last year, I had the, actually, it's not the session, the session before with Senator Bates, I was, who's a great senator, I was able to pass legislation for the first time that labeled opioid bottles like Percocet and, and Oxy with a caution that says, caution, this can cause overdose death, this can be addictive, this is addictive which um, unfortunately, you know, this is an epidemic in our country and it's driven by a lot of greed um, because this labeling should have been there all along, you know? So we, we didn't have that labeling and a lot of good people got addicted to what they thought was harmless pain medication. And when it stopped, they were driven to street medication which killed them, but also even before it stopped, it caused them to abuse it. And this doesn't measure, it measures just the people who died, but there's so many people who live, but um, like uh, a young man who I adore, Aaron, uh, live in a wheelchair with um, severe, severe disabilities because of um, the brain damage and the, what it causes. The other uh, big thing that we're seeing in the North County is, and this we were seeing before COVID, is the um, heightened truancy rates. We're seeing increased truancy for kids from school. And um, the research shows that that truancy rate is related to the ready availability of marijuana that kids are, because of the legalization of marijuana and, and that that's the law, but that's the law for adults. However, um, because of its availability, kids' brains are uh, basically, a lot of kids are arguing with their families. This is what I hear from moms all day long uh, when that they're arguing with their family that the, because it's legal, that means it's not harmful to them. Um, and the problem is, as we know, um, I'm not going to talk about the impact on adults because that's the law, uh, but with children and minors and teenagers, their brain is not developed and the effects of marijuana on young brains um, is, is, not, is, is not good at all. It, it makes them lose interest in school sports and other things and uh, with a high THC level. So we started a campaign uh, called With Kids, 
uh, called Smoking is Not Coping. Um, and, uh, pro, you know, had um, community members join us and provide um, presents and things if you win the campaign. We're trying to get the word out as much as possible. The third area I want to discuss is the impact on children. This is the area that, that is, um, as you know, near and dear to my heart. And um, it, the, the impact of kids not being in school, not being in their faith places, not being in their sports has been fairly devastating on our children. Um, Rady's Children's Hospital is seeing a very heightened suicide rates, uh, depression with children. Um, they are seeing quadruple effect of suspected um, physical abuse and sexual abuse on children. Our Internet Crimes Against Children uh, Task Force and our um, Human Trafficking Task Force are seeing four times the reports of predators trying to lure our kids because they're spending more time on their phones, on their tablets, on their computers. School is where there are the, um, the mandated reporters and um, that's where kids are seen and heard and um, you know, distance learning is not allowing that kind of detection for kids for their abuse. Um, I wrote a letter to the governor about this um, when last time that our region was going to go into the reclosure of schools. Um, and my position, I'm not an expert on COVID. I'll leave that to the doctors. My position is simply about I'm an expert in public safety. And it was important to me that the governor also see the harm that is coming to our kids, which can be lasting through a lifetime when you leave kids in the situation. What to do about it, we just have to do better. And I, I, I don't have an answer to that, but just um, calling it a day on kids and their learning and being able to to see and hear them and get them away from abuse and educating parents more. Um, one thing that um, you, we've been involved with before and during the pandemic is a first of its kind collaboration with philanthropy um, uh, in the human, San Diego Human Trafficking Collective. Trafficking Prevention Collective, which you can you can find at sdtpc.org, and this collaboration with philanthropy, uh, it, you know, was was led by UBS um, and uh, and uh, the DA's office and other partners that came along, and it provides prevention education for internet crimes, for human trafficking, exploitation to our kids. You know, we give them these phones without a manual. We don't tell them what's going to come their way. And being able to provide that education that matches 5th, 7th, ninth, and 11th grade education um, in our schools for free. And we, uh, we didn't give up during the pandemic. We converted to online. Hundreds of teachers have been... Um, learning the curriculum because this is a teach a teacher so that it can be spread wider to 500,000 kids in our community. It's been very successful, but the pandemic has set us back because kids are not in school, but we're trying to, to meet the moment through education, including the chamber, you know, being able to put out the word that just because your kid is home doesn't mean they're safe they could be getting exploited. We've also seen an increase in human trafficking against minors. So, so these are a few of the challenges. The last challenge I think you know about is the, the protest versus riot, you know? We are, um, you know, we all are. I mean, this is our constitution, our first amendment, the right to peacefully protest. 
is absolutely respected by DA's office law enforcement. However, we, um, we did, I did not think it was uh, hard to detect when something is a true protest and something is a riot, looting, vandalism, arson. And um, I drew a clear line between those because um, the, the one is not the other. And, and our community had to remain safe from those things. Um, we didn't think it was a hard, we didn't understand how in Portland and other places they can't tell the difference because the difference is very clear under the law. And um, we uh, joined to protect the right to peaceful protest, but to also charge um, 28 uh, violent protesters with felony crimes because that's what they did. When you burn buildings, you assault, you loot, that, that's not protest, that's crime. Um, and, you know, with that, we, we uh, took heat and, you know, um, other protests and, but that's life. I mean, I, I, my job is to do my job of protecting the community, of upholding the law, of being the guardian of justice, of the law, you know, always looking to reform. We are constantly looking for alternatives to custody for people who are addicted, for first time offenders, for we have a very successful diversion program um, that has a 3% recidivism rate, unheard of. Um, veterans treatment court, very successful, very low recidivism rates, drug court, mental health courts, we are big supporters of reasonable reform, but we are also we also stand by the law and by public safety and by victims' rights. I think you can do both, and that's what our mission is, and that's what we've been doing. So I'll stop here to leave the 10 minutes or so for questions. I hope I gave you a good overview of what's going on. So Thank Summer, you. real quick, before you had hopped on, I, I had overheard that one of the issues that are impacting Oceanside and Oceanside business community uh, is chronic homelessness. Would you mind speaking real quick to your or our policy on homelessness and the, pro the prosecution process on that issue? Um, yes, I mean, th this is a, an issue that is plaguing everywhere. And uh, unfortunately, um, it has gotten worse with what we're dealing with. We've seen um, encampments because using, you know, the guidance from CDC that you can't disrupt an encampment because it could spread the virus. That has been obviously used and abused by some who just want to live a criminal lifestyle. Um, uh, but that's what law enforcement is dealing with right now. Uh, we, we meet regularly, you know, with the sheriff and the police chiefs, and this is always at the top of the issues. Uh, we were making a dent with the, with the Oceanside and the sheriff's hot teams uh, that were joining with social workers to go in and extract and provide services. Uh, but it got interrupted with the CDC guideline as to not disrupting encampments and uh, all of the things that go along with it. It's something I'm very concerned about. Again, just like the protests versus riot, I, I see a very clear line. Uh, I see that we need to do better to extract people from homelessness before it sets in, um, before it, it, it's there. But we, we also have a criminal element within the people on the street that don't want to live by anyone's rules. So we need to distinguish. It's not a one size fits all. We need to be able to be compassionate and address um, homelessness and try to, to handle it before it happens. One way that we are doing it in North County, and this is very exciting. Um, I see Crystal from uh, Supervisor Desmond's office on the line, and this is a collaboration with Supervisor Desmond is we are bringing a North County Family Justice Center to the North County. 
because the number one you see, if you see women and children on the street, that usually means the number one driver of that is domestic violence, abuse, human trafficking. So by bringing a North County Family Justice Center with a strong housing connector in it, our goal with, with Supervisor Desmond is to extract people and, and, and not set them on a path to homelessness by having shelter immediately available and transitional housing immediately available. We're also working on a crisis hub in the North County. What that means is the ability for a police officer or a deputy sheriff to take someone who is acting strangely, um, flailing, doing things that are clearly not, not normal, and take that person immediately to a crisis hub for medical and psychological intervention and connection to treatment. This has worked in other regions because um, there's no way that they can take everybody to jail or should because all that happens is they get out and they recycle because the sheriff has to leave room for the more violent offenders. So these crisis hubs, I know that Supervisor Desmond has been working very hard to get them going and our office is 100% in support. We we did a paper, which I invite you all to read. It has some great ideas that came from the community. We did a mental health um, intersection with homelessness and the criminal justice system report that displays the 10 recommendations that can really transform our homelessness and our criminal justice system. And one of those recommendations were the crisis hubs. Um, and we're starting in the North County because there's a big problem there. So we're hoping uh, that that will be a solution. Thanks, Summer. Um, we do have a question um, in the chat box. Um, what are the initiatives addressing human trafficking and is this trending up or down? So human trafficking during this time as to adults is steady. As to minors, it has increased. Our Human Trafficking Task Force 24-7 constantly with DAs and investigators there uh, is constantly on the tail of runaway 14, 15, 13-year-olds that we find um, in human trafficking situations. They are plied away on their phones, on their tablets, you know, invited to parties to get away from the just being home and when they run away, they end up with drugged, with alcohol, and then really bad things happen to them. And they take pictures of it and they use the pictures to extort them into remaining and not reporting what happened to them. So we're seeing an increase in that. So we've uh, doubled down on our task force efforts. We are uh, converting our human trafficking collective uh, information online to help parents understand and ask the right questions and see the right signs. Also for parents not to wait if they have a runaway teen thinking nothing is wrong to report right away so that we can try to extract before really bad things happen. Um, so we, we are working very hard on it. That's, you know, um, San Diego County had shown great promise. We, um, I like to study everything because, you know, I don't like just talk. I like numbers and data, data-driven justice. So we did our numbers for San Diego and before the pandemic, we were showing that we had um, um, improved by 27%, unlike other regions that had only improved by 1%. Um, we had shown that through our multidisciplinary approach of attacking it from a tough prosecution perspective, from a prevention education perspective, bringing the largest prevention education program that I talked about to our county, all the superintendents bought onto it, that it'll be implemented and had begun implementation in the schools and through the protection of victims, increasing housing for them, shelter, resources. 
Um, so prevention, protection, and prosecution, and also partnership with the community. That four P's method was working. And then we hit a wall with our, our kids being home so much uh, that we see this increase with minors. Okay, thank you. Um, so just w one other question. Before you got on the call, we were talking um, about some of the propositions, including Prop 20. And I don't know if um, you mentioned you can't talk talk about politics. I don't know if you're precluded from talking about that. I was just wondering if the district's attorneys throughout the state had weighed in on, on that ballot measure at all. Um, I don't know what everyone else did, but I had supported it. I don't think it's politics. I support the principles behind it. Uh, because it is uh, a measured, um, a measured um, closing of many loopholes. For example, Proposition 57 passed, and people were told when it passed that it only affects non-serious, non-violent crime. Well, um, what they didn't <laughs> know is the fine print that non-serious, non-violent includes human trafficking, it includes uh, rape of an intoxicated or an unconscious person. It includes a lot of different crimes that I don't consider to be non-serious, non-violent. Um, and, and so, for example, we had a human trafficker who had multiple victims. What 57 does is after they serve their sentence as to one victim, one count, they can be released. So, so basically like a, a, a group coupon. You can, you can um, victimize multiple victims and you get punished for just one act. That's the fine print at 57. 20 is, was supposed to fix that. So I won't talk about 20 as a proposition. I'll talk about the content of 20 was, was because the laws had big holes in them. Okay. Also with theft under 950, um, even the, it, it kind of read as if this was for a first time offender, but the thing is you can do theft under 950, 365 days in a year, and you still have a misdemeanor. So people who are doing retail organized theft, um, you know, these businesses lose. I mean, you might've seen in San Francisco, Walgreens is closing and many businesses are, are leaving because uh, not only because of um, the, the loopholes in the law that allow multiple, not, you know, it reads as if it's for first time, which we're all for giving those chances, but then it doesn't address the chronic and organized. But in San Francisco, they don't even enforce theft for as a misdemeanor. So, you know, it's, it's just a freebie again, and, and it's the communities that get hurt. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. I appreciate you um, addressing that. And um, just uh, thank you for taking time to be with us today and for this, this update. And thank you for the work that you do and advocating for the victims in our community. And uh, we just, we really appreciate you. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Have a and good day. Scott Scott, I'm adding in a link to our newsletter if anybody would like to sign up and, and see more about recent updates of all the things that Summer wasn't able to talk to you about today, but all the good work that our office is doing uh, daily. Great. Uh, thank you, Cameron, and thank you again, Summer. Um, we are going to move on to our legislative reports. And uh, first up is um, Kyle Crayhill from Congressman Levin's office. So uh, first of all, Kyle, um, congratulations on, on Congressman Levin's reelection. Uh, looks like you will be with us uh, at these meetings for a couple more years. Well, definitely looking forward to continuing to join you all. And um, Congressman Levin just appreciates the opportunity to serve the district and continue on uh, doing what he's doing fighting for veterans and our families, the environment. So I won't go too much more to that, but uh, talk about the things he's actually working on specifically. Uh, just looking a little backwards, um, you know, at the height of the election, just in October, um, I'm happy to say that President Trump signed Congressman Levin's bill uh, to expand vet center eligibility counseling. So uh, folks who served in the National Guard, uh, the reserves, Coast Guards, who uh, were deployed to an emergency situation, whether it's civil unrest or a natural disaster, this expands their eligibility to go to VA vet centers to receive counseling. Um, so really uh, 
good chance to continue supporting our veterans who served, even if they were not in the active duty, um, but being able to get the counseling they need. Um, and just shows that bipartisanship can still happen even in the height of the election. Um, and then another bill the congressman recently introduced, which is important, um, I think relative locally, is to require NRC inspectors, uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission inspectors at nuclear power plants when they're transferring spent fuel. Um, so normally NRC inspectors are always at an operating nuclear power plant. This would require them to be there when you're transferring spent fuel to the canisters like we have now uh, left at San Onofre. Um, this is important, he thought, because of the incident that occurred um, in August uh, 2018 when a canister was almost dropped. Um, so having that kind of extra layer of oversight, um, he thought that was a very important part. What came out of his song's task force report. <clears throat> also recently, we were really happy to uh, announce that North County Transit District received $9.8 million uh, to modernize their train and crossing control systems. Um, kind of into the, the weeds too much, the NCTD could talk to you more about the project. Um, but essentially really old uh, systems that are monitor that are making the, how the trains go uh, here in North County. And this would help modernize those. Uh, Congressman Levin advocated for that money at the federal level and he'll continue to advocate to bring federal dollars to our district. And just a couple of other things looking forward. Um, we're arranging a visit with the new commander of the Army Corps. Um, there's a new commander both at the LA district um, that covers our area as well as the South Pacific Division which covers all the West Coast essentially. So we're inviting both of them to come and tour the projects in our district, particularly the Oceanside Harbor um, and the shoreline. Uh, so we can, they can see with their own eyes uh, what's happened to our beaches. Um, it's likely gonna happen in December. Um, and you know, we think that's important so that they understand how important it is they get their study done so they can move forward with a project to restore our beaches um, in collaboration with the city uh, that's already moving forward. And, uh, finally, last thing is just that uh, our office uh, staff on the staff have been working with the city uh, staff to try to get out the kinks in the Federal Railroad Administration's approval of the quiet zones, the railroad quiet zones. So we finally get those done. Uh, way behind uh, schedule on that project, but we understand how important it is and there's a federal uh, aspect of that that we're trying to really kick them in the pants to make sure we get that done so that our tourism and our residents don't suffer from that uh, loud noise any further. And with that, I'll wrap it up and send it back to you, Scott. Thanks. Thanks, Kyle. And um... Thanks for the update on the quiet zones too, because there are, we do get questions on that and uh, people have been waiting for that for, for a while. Um, so next I'd like to uh, invite uh, Chris Marsh from Senator Bates office to give us a brief update. Thanks. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I wanna start off by noting that um, the Senator since we last spoke uh, got highest marks uh, with the Cal Chamber score. As you know, the Cal Chamber rates all the legislators on 10, pre or 10 bills that they've selected were of importance for job creation or voting against were important for job creation or to help with the California economy. Uh, Senator Bates, as has become typical, uh, rated highest among her colleagues in the Senate um, as she has every year since she's been a member of the legislature. So very happy to uh, have received that honor. Um, additionally, uh, as you know, the Senator has a coastal district and as such climate change and uh, coastal erosion and um, those issues have always been of uh, particular importance to the Senator. However, we were uh, a bit uh, dismayed by the governor's actions. Uh, Senator Bates and her colleagues have been working on uh, AB 3030, which would have uh, accomplish a lot of what the governor has just uh, done via executive order without um, going too much into detail, because I don't think I have the time here, but um, the governor moved up a lot of the deadlines and, and some, of the, some of the actions to preserve the environment and to preserve the coast. Um, however, in doing so as an executive order, um, the legislators were working on ways to make sure that this, this push did not impact negatively uh, local businesses and local municipalities, which we had been hearing from our local cities quite a bit, uh, that those two goals need to be taken seriously and concordantly. Um, so the senator released a statement, um, I wouldn't say condemning the governor, that would be too strong, but saying that the governor should have respected the legislative process where uh, the senators and the assembly members of both parties were working on the same goal uh, with, um, while working through some of the problems that were um, elicited by the cities. 
So we're not sure what's going to happen with AB 3030 next, if the legislators will decide to take that offer back up uh, against the governor's proposal, or rather decree, um, but we will see. Uh, Senator Bates pointed towards AB 793 in her comments, showing that the legislature had worked in a bipartisan fashion to create historic and bipartisan plastic recycling bill uh, last month the governor had signed. So she used that as evidence that the governor should have given the legislature a bit more time to hammer out um, this effort. Um, and then I want to also point out that we are still in the dark as to when the legislature will reconvene. Uh, we have not been given word by the majority party yet. Uh, we think that that is due to COVID, obviously, but also that the majority party was waiting until after the election to determine when the legislature would reconvene uh, and how they would do it, um, how they will handle uh, COVID. But in the meantime, we're all very interested to see what happens with San Diego County and are very concerned and share uh, Council Member Weiss's concerns from the beginning of the call about the effect on local businesses. With that, that uh, is my report. Thanks, Chris, and uh, thanks for um, uh, the reminder on on the senator's um, stellar voting record um, with the Cal Chamber. We we did know about that, and we we did share that out. So thank you. Um, we do not have anybody from the assembly member's office here, so we're going to move right along to uh, Crystal from uh, County Supervisor Jim Desmond's office. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to try and be as brief as possible. Um, just wanted to, I know Summer is no longer on the call, but wanted to let everyone know that her office has been instrumental in preventing sexually violent predators who prey on children to be released and housed in North County. So we appreciate her office. She really, it's really one of the first times in San Diego County that not once, but twice, we've been able to block people from being um, inland North County located. So her office does tremendous work. Um, also, uh, to piggyback onto her sentiments about overdose and mental health, Supervisor Desmond is going to continue to focus on mental health, um, drug addiction, criminal activity, homelessness, and how they all intersect together. He has severe concerns about um, the COVID impact to um, overdose, um, homelessness, suicide rates. So we are going to continue to work with her offices, with county mental health, with the individual cities to make sure we are doing everything we can to prevent that. Um, and, and also to roll that into um, COVID, a lot of you have heard yesterday that San Diego County is moving towards the purple tier, uh, which is the most restrictive tier uh, that the state of California has set up. So that's alarming to us that we could potentially be going back to shutdowns, which means um, that um, no more indoor church services, no more indoor dining, no more indoor gyms, movie theaters, museums, aquariums, card rooms. Retail will be scaled back to 25% occupancy. Schools that have not opened will not be allowed to reopen. Um, and no university in-person lectures. Uh, this is alarming to us. We don't feel that the numbers are warranting this for San Diego County. Uh, our, our initial onset was to preserve PPE equipment to make sure our hospitals were protected. There were beds available, respirators available. All those numbers are really great in San Diego County. We have a uh, Fortunately, a lot of the positive cases are not needing hospitalizations. So it's um, the mortality rate is very low. The positivity rate is still high, uh, but we feel like everything needs to be factored in, including hospitalization rates. Uh, the Board of Supervisors at their last meeting passed a resolution to urge the governor not only to provide local control, but to take into consideration our hospitals and make that a large factor on potential shutdowns because of the impacts that are happening to the businesses, our children, to um, you know, just the fact that suicide rates and op opioid addiction is up and overdoses are up are alarming to us. Um, there's a lot of other things going on. The supervisor is working on a lot behind the scenes. We are sharing all of that through the chamber. So stay in touch with your chambers. Scott, you've been a great partner working with the Oceanside Chamber um, is, a, is 
a pleasure for me because I get to work with you most often, but the supervisor really appreciates the work that you're doing and we will make sure that everything that is taking place in our District 5 is shared through the Oceanside Chamber. So please um, use them as a resource or reach out to me directly. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh... Thank you for continuing um, to, you know, to the supervisor and your staff for continuing to bring attention to the other um, impacts of the shutdowns. I think the public health officials have focused just um, ex too much exclusively on COVID and have ignored the, um, the unintended consequences of the shutdown. So thank you and, and thank you for all the timely information that, that you share. Um, you know, for us to get out to the business community that that's very helpful even when it's bad news it's good to have it um, as early as possible so thank you you're welcome um so that concludes our our legislative updates and um and i think were there any other updates that we we missed from from anyone on the call all right so with that, uh, we're going to conclude for this month. Um, our next meeting is on December 3rd, um, and we will be sending out notification um, about our, our content for that meeting. But uh, we look, look forward to seeing you all again um, in about a month. So have a great day, and thank you, everyone, for your time.